Hello and welcome to Shop Talk Live. Joining us today is Elias Munshi, EG Group's Commercial Director, Paula Thomas, Chief Content Officer at Liquid Barcodes, and Rutter's CEO, Scott Hartman. Dan, over to you. Shop Talk Live, Episode 9. Uh, engaging the convenience store customer of the future. And today we're looking at formats, loyalty and technology, always about technology at the moment. Um, we've, got a great, um, we've got a great lineup for you today. It's a PAX 45 minutes. Um, just before we, we introduce uh, our first guest, um, perhaps it's a good point to say as we, some of us at least get into uh, our summer holiday period, um, just to reflect back on the on the episodes, the nine episodes of, of Shop Talk Live we've had so far, um, it's very much been a global conversation with the industry, and we hope a very productive one. It's certainly been interesting um, from from our point of view, from my point of view. Um, we've just tallying up. We've had uh, two thousand two hundred um, industry colleagues attend um one of our shop talks and from 54 countries altogether that's across the nine episodes so just a really warm welcome uh, to a record audience today uh, thank you for tuning in again and um you know it's been great fun and we hope to continue this um and and keep growing so thanks for tuning in um big thank you uh, to you all um so uh I'd like to introduce um, uh, a, a good friend of mine uh, from EG Group, uh, Ilias Munshi. And, and Ilias, perhaps if you'd like to join us and we can have a bit of a chat. Good afternoon, Dan. How are you? I'm very well. I'm very well. Um, Ilias, so, so welcome to Shop Talk Live. Um, we hope that many people in the audience, they've certainly, everyone's certainly had the chance um, you know, to, to see some of the stuff that you've been, you've been doing recently. But before we get into looking at Frontier Park, um, perhaps it would be good just to, just to sort of think about the, you know, the, the, the general situation. And it's been quite a, a tough experience for retailers the last few months, hasn't it? And I guess EG Group are no different to anybody else. It's been quite a challenge. For EG Group, like a lot of the retailers that will be joining us on Shop Talk Live, a uh, very challenging period for everybody. Um, those of you who don't know EG Group, we operate across 10 international markets. Uh, we have a, a site network of over 6,200 locations uh, in 10 different markets with, with 55,000 colleagues. Um, so I think it's been a, a challenging period in the sense food service has taken a big hit in terms of uh, in a lot of the markets. Uh, we had to close the food service businesses, uh, but give, given the petrol station operations we operate with the convenience stores, a lot of governments uh, wanted us to remain open, uh, so we stayed open in, in those segments. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's credit to our staff um, who put themselves on the front line to service the communities that they, they work with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so even, you know, uh, the local residents, emergency services were accessing our sites. Uh, and as now, like, the world is kind of waking up from COVID and uh, lockdowns are kind of being uh, eased up, um, it's interesting to see how consumers are reacting uh, to the changing world. And as retailers, we've all got to embrace that change as well. Yeah, and what kind of thing, on that point, um, what kind of changes are you seeing in terms of behavior from, from your customers, Ilias? I think uh, we've got to kind of uh, uh, split it down to three levels, uh, Dan. Um, if, you, if we just kind of focus on the customer, I think we've now got a, a consumer who's looking, uh, who's a bit more cautious about getting out there. Um, I know the media covers people uh, hitting the beaches. You reference the summer holidays. Um, I, I think that is an outcome of frustration, uh, having to stay indoors. Um, so if we look at the, today's customer, when we opened up the um, uh, drive-through locations for food service, the British psyche was always about, oh, we don't like queuing up. But you would have seen on the media coverage, people were happy to queue up for two miles for a KFC or a Burger King. Um, and that, pre-COVID, you would have never seen. It was all about convenience. 
So we've now got a changed consumer who's kind of thinking about um, the, the, the going out, how do they kind of uh, normal, get back into a kind of a normal routine. Um, some of that is born out of the frustration of being um, uh, locked up. And now uh, as they're going out, how will they kind of interact with retailers? So drive through is a good example. I think we've, we've seen a big um, surge in delivery uh, as a segment as well. Um, so again, customers wanting to pre-order, pre-pay, and then um, have the uh, items delivered to them. So th there's a big shift again. So as um, uh, drive throughs opened up, uh, customers are able to pick up takeouts, we've seen uh, things normalize in those segments. So the customer is one group. We've got to make them feel safe. We've got to make them feel that they can access our products and services, if need be, on a, on a frictionless platform. Um, but the, the other two groups who are equally more important and are part of the kind of dynamic are the staff. So I think all the retailers will be on this uh, uh, call uh, they, they'll share with me their kind of sentiment around creating a safe environment for the workforce as well. Uh, I mentioned, you know, testament to our site teams. They've done a grand job, but we've had to put in, uh, we've had to invest in making sure social distancing is maintained. There's perspex screens at the cashier's desks, uh, uh, making sure uh, sanitizers are available. And there's a whole new regime in the store in terms of keeping the place clean and sanitized. So all these kind of dynamics, um, staff have to, had to take on board. And I think the third group, which is important, is your supply chain. So your brand partners and supply chain, um, they've also got to feel safe and comfortable that they can continue delivering to your locations. Uh, you've looked at and reflected on the procedures and processes at site level. So I think as well as the customer dynamic changing, I think it's a new world for the staff and the supply chain and brand partners. 100%. And now, um, I, ha I asked you a question when we were talking about this a few weeks ago, and I said, you know, um, can we feature one of your stores and uh, as, a, as, a, as a virtual tour? Um, just, you know, because retailers, as you know, love going around stores, and we can't do that physically at the moment. Um, so you came up with uh, you, what, what is your latest iteration at Frontier Park, and maybe we could pull up um, a few a few pictures of, of that which many people will have seen and we can just flick through them um, but on your drive-through point um, this is kind of drive-through heaven isn't it um, this uh, this this site Ilias in terms of drive-through because you've got of course your Starbucks drive-through which you guys really have been uh, you know developing very successfully in, in the UK market for instance for, for a number of years now but you've also got um, a Greg's drive-through on the main building. Um, and you've also got some, um, there's the Greg's there, you know, um, and you've also got um, a KFC uh, drive through as well. Um, and just staying on that picture, I mean, which is interesting in itself. I mean, obviously KFC is an interesting brand. We can perhaps talk about that a bit later. Big yeah. opportunity for you guys, I know, but, but that's, it's a, it's a double lane drive through there as well. So, you know, you really feel that, um, that drive-through is, is very, very, even more important in the future, don't you? Yeah, uh, for sure. I think, Dan, um, uh, interesting kind of uh, uh, observations on the drive-through. Um, who would have thought a few years ago a brand like Greg's? So for colleagues, Greg's is a, is a bakery brand uh, in the UK, so it's trying to kind of uh, engage the value customer. Um, so it's all about kind of uh, pastries, fresh food, daily fresh food. Um, and they, they never considered drive-through as, as an operation, but today uh, we're trialing with them the drive-through proposition. So even though the items are of low value to, it, to in comparison to picking up a, a KFC bucket or picking up your Starbucks coffee, um, uh, Greg's, uh, the drive-throughs are proving very popular uh, for, for the customers. And if you then kind of um, uh, go to the KFC image, um, I think in the new world, our, our brands, yeah, we, the brands we work with, um, and we work with a lot of the leading brands such as uh, KFC, Burger King, Starbucks, uh, Subway, they're all considering what is the store of the future? What is it going to look like? And um, 
Are we going to have stores with smaller seating areas? Um, given the kind of uh, restrictions in terms of social distancing? And is there going to be a bigger emphasis on uh, dual drive-through lanes? So it may be that one of the drive-through lanes is for uh, order pickup. So customers basically, they, they make their order, they prepay for the order, and they just go into the drive-through to just go to a window and pick up their order. And the other drive-through lane will be for more of the conventional customer wants to go through the floor of the store. Um, so again, uh, the jewel is out in terms of what model is going to work, but this really kind of then links into store of the future, technology, what investment do retailers need to consider uh, when they're trying to execute the different kind of brand offers on their location. So even Starbucks, if you, if you look at them as a, as a global retailer, big emphasis on technology, how do you get customers to kind of prepay, pre-order uh, for items? But drive-through is also part of their of their model, and um, this is the success of all these brands. I think um, if we look at pre-COVID, um, what was the breakdown in terms of customer behaviour? I can share with colleagues that uh, prior to COVID, it was roughly about fifty-five percent of customers who would sit in or do a takeout from a store. So they'd walk in physically into the store. So if you look at our site uh, in terms of car parking, that, that's a big feature and investment that we've undertaken as EG Group because customers want parking facilities. So pre-COVID, um, about 55% of the customers, they would eat in or go into the store to pick up their items. drive through contributed about roughly 30, 31% and delivery only made up about 14% uh, of the breakdown of sales on, a, on, a, on one of our locations, on our food service locations. Then we had lockdown. During lockdown, when we started kind of, uh, government started easing up on lockdown, what we started seeing was it, everything opened up with delivery. So I think delivery providers, they got very excited that this is the new world. Everyone is just gonna order. Um, so. The challenge with delivery is still the kind of uh, commercials uh, and making it uh, work not only for the delivery provider, but for the customer as well. Because yeah. as soon as we started seeing drive through open, and then we've started seeing uh, takeout open where customers can walk in and pick up their order, we've seen a, a shift again. So now uh, the eating is around, or what I would say going into the store physically, it's about 13 to 15%. Delivery is 38%, so there's been a marked kind of decline in delivery since uh, uh, lockdowns eased. Uh, and the drive-through, again, you're, lo you're looking at about circa 50% of customers going through the drive-through. So that just shows you the sentiment of the customers that drive-through and how you facilitate that purchasing and engagement is critical. Well, that's really interesting. Let's just uh, bring in something from Australia. There's always, uh, we always get a good crowd of Australia, uh, Australians listening, um, and we do today uh, as well, even though it's quite late uh, at night. I always make that joke. They must get tired of that. Um, but in Australia, you've just launched uh, the EG Club app, haven't you? And I, obviously, technology is a big focus for this discussion, and, and that's the other side of, of, of what you've been talking about just now, isn't it? You know, giving... Yeah, so... It's about, yeah, so I think um, a lot of the global brands we work with or some of our proprietary brands, there's a massive effort in terms of um, marketing uh, your product or service. Um, but I think uh, in the day and age of uh, technology, I think uh, we've been very fortunate to work with a lot of leading brands um, who've invested in technology platforms. Um, so app technology, LED menu boards, all these are things now today's consumer has access to. Um, so menu boards, for example, we've moved away from traditional boards to more engaging menu boards where you can have a breakfast kind of promotion uh, being shown in the early hours. You can then have a breakfast menu up and during, throughout the day, the menu changes to engage the customer. Now apps, um, again, uh, one of the bigger kind of investments a lot of brand partners are kind of making and we as franchisees and licensees are contributing towards this because we firmly believe in digital platforms. So again, apps have been developed.
but the, the, therein is the challenge. I, I think over the last few years, a lot of uh, brands that develop their own proprietary apps, but if you look at it from a, a customer perspective, that presents a, um, a knowledge transfer challenge for a lot of customers. They're having to learn different apps. So they've got to learn an SO app, they've got to learn a BP app, they've got to learn uh, a Carrefour app, or they've got to learn um, Starbucks app, Subway app. So different brands have different approaches in terms of how they engage the customer through the digital platform. The technology platform in terms of the hardware and software, they're, they're also kind of uh, different. Um, so again, when customers come on our site, it's very difficult for us to map uh, the customer journey when they visit one of our locations. Did Dan buy fuel first and then he bought his Starbucks coffee or was it the other way around? Uh, to us, Dan is just a transaction. Um, there's no way of linking the different touch points within our business. So what we decided to do as a leadership team is we respect and value the investment the brand partners have done in uh, developing app platforms, but why don't we create a vision where we have an app layer or a technology layer which sits on top of all the brand partner technology stacks. So we're not getting rid of the Starbucks app, we're not getting rid of the app, we're actually building on it. So what we want to try and create is a shop window which allows the customer to purchase their fuel, their groceries and food service items in a single app. So that addresses the challenge of the knowledge transfer. Now the customer and we've seen it with the delivery partner uh, technology platforms, when you kind of create that shop window for customers to engage and purchase, that uniform experience works um, in terms of uh, getting customers to buy more. And uh, the research shows when you, when you empower customers to buy and make the decisions themselves, the average ticket goes up as well. So we've launched EG Club in Australia it's the first phase. Uh, we, we've done it out of um, uh, last year when we completed the acquisition of uh, Woolworths uh, locations, convenience store locations and petrol stations in Australia. Um, what we wanted to do was, um, as part of our transition service agreement, um, customers were on the Woolworths app. So Australian colleagues, um, they, they, they would know that in Australia, the consumer is very keen on getting their four cent discount. Um, so retailers like Woolworths for years have been offering a, uh, a four cent discount. So we've got to honor that and respect that as part of our kind of commercial agreements. Um, so what we've done is we've created EG Club. It's the first market we've launched EG Club in. What it allows customers to do is um, view fuel pricing, choose, do, do a journey planner if they wish to get to a location. It allows them to kind of uh, do spot checks on prices of fuel. It does a comparison of average pricing in the area. These are all dynamics of the Australian consumer. But what we've now done is we've created a platform that we can then utilize for the other markets we operate in, whether that's in Europe or in the US. Um, again, in the US, uh, we, we purchased the Cumberland Farms business. Um, and I, I know we've got Rutters on, on, on the uh, panel as well. Um, but in the US, app technology has been there for a while uh, and there's a lot of successful operators who've created apps. But what the need we had was, given the three retail channels we operate, fuel, grocery and food service, EG Club delivers and links all the different retail channels together. Well, that's really interesting, and there's a lot of information about it, about that about the EG Club app in the in the article which we featured and uh, which every attendee has had, and um, I know many of them have read it. Well, look, don't go away, Elias. We'd like you back again a little bit later um, uh, after on the panel. Um, but between um, between us is, uh, is 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 Paula Thomas, who's the chief content officer at Liquid Barcode. So, Elias, if um, if you could uh, if you could hang in there, and we'll bring you back. Hi, Paula. Um, Hi, Dan. We're in your we're in your capable hands, um, and we we're kind of we're kind of moving to loyalty, which obviously sits in the back of, of everything that Ilias and I have been have been discussing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you have a tremendous global view of, of what's working in loyalty, so why not take us through it? And I know you've got a few slides just to demonstrate what you think's working out there. 
Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. And I know Shop Talk Live is, is doing super well for you. So congratulations on that. And certainly from Liquid Barcodes, we're delighted to be taking part today. Um, I really resonate with a lot of what Ilias was saying um, already, and hopefully my own points will emphasize exactly what he was saying. So in the short time we have available today, I wanted to talk about the top three trends that I'm seeing. So as Chief Content Officer, I have the luxury of writing and recording about loyalty globally for uh, liquid barcodes, anything that I find interesting and relevant. And these are the key topics that I'm seeing at the moment. So first and foremost, I really believe in the combination of fun and functional. So how the best digital strategies are in fact proving to be both useful and rewarding. And I think that's particularly true right now with the pandemic. Then I want to talk briefly about beyond transactions. And this is something that the global loyalty industry is really talking about. How can we move to emotional loyalty? So there's a couple of ideas in here for retailers interested in this idea. And finally, we're going to talk about what we're calling extreme loyalty through subscriptions. So it's a model we're all familiar with in other verticals, but it's really exploding in convenience retail. So I wanted to talk on that quickly as well. So let's just have a quick look. Um, first of all, I'm going to talk about KFC. I knew Elias would be talking about his flagship down in Australia. And what I always love as a marketeer, in fact, and you mentioned the global view, Dan, this is the homepage for KFC in the United States. And you can see that it's actually just focused on food and it's very functional. And the only way as a brand you can connect with KFC is to join the Colonel's Club, which is really just an email database to get offers and deals. But instead, by contrast, if you look at their Chinese operation, there's an entirely different strategy. Now, I'm sure most of you don't speak Chinese. I certainly don't. But this is an extraordinary case study. And in fact, it's just one we've talked about on our podcast this week. And it's essentially what they're calling a super app. And I think it's the best example I've seen, Dan, in terms of combining fun and functionality. And when I wrote the article about KFC in China last year, already 120 million people had downloaded this. So I think it's a really good example. And it comes from, I suppose, some very good insights insights. And Ilias used the term customer mindset. And KFC had exactly that idea. How are we being perceived by our customers? And it turned out the perception was in China, KFC was a brand that was having a middle age crisis. So they decided digital was the solution and completely reinvented themselves. So on the next slide, I'll give you just the highlights of exactly what they have built. And again, there's loads more detail we don't have time for today. But first and foremost, obviously, any offers or deals that customers are looking for are always available within this application. So there's very generous instant gratification, there's anchor deals and tactical promotions. In addition to that, every single touch point that you might imagine with KFC has been digitized. So the next point we're talking about is really all of the different integrations of payments, ordering for delivery, e-gifting and pre-order and prepay. And again, we know that's extremely important. And perhaps when this was built three years ago, nobody would have realized quite how important. But what I really love, in fact, that they did was really the icing on top of the cake. And what they recognized is there was an opportunity for fun. So they realized that gamers was a fabulous demographic for them to target. So there are over 560 million gamers in China, and they really realized they could leverage the youth and scale and passion of that community to connect and essentially youthify KFC, the brand. So here are a couple of examples. First of all, they developed an augmented reality game, which you could only play by leaving your bedroom where you normally play games and going out into stores, really bringing that gaming community together. Secondly, they did partnerships with the likes of Leagues of Legend with extraordinary insights such as buttons where you can order food literally while you still play the game and also food that you can literally eat with one hand. So showing brilliant loyalty to the customer by partnering with the best brands. And then literally looking at, you know, getting rewards from Kentucky Fried Chicken. So the brand association was phenomenal. So to me, this is my favorite case study that I've written in the last two and a half years. And one I really think demonstrates the combination of fun and functionality with a global brand. Very interesting. Great. 
So thank you. So the next point I wanted to touch on is really beyond transactions to emotional loyalty. And what I find fascinating about this, it's the biggest conversation that is happening in loyalty at the moment. And I mean everybody from banking to airlines to hotels, and obviously including ourselves in convenience retail. So I have two examples of how to create emotional loyalty because it's very different for every single branch. So BP Me, most of you will know, relaunched their loyalty program last year in June 2019 when they left the Nectar program. And it started off actually as an app where you could just pay in the car, but then they literally added in a simple points-based program where you earn points for fuel and in-store purchases and car wash. So totally effective, but a very functional program, I think you'll agree. And then I suppose what they realized was there was an opportunity to go a step further. And we all know that most brands do already have a charity proposition and a CSR strategy. But in fact, there was an opportunity that they realized to go beyond CSR. And I think the big insight that they realized is, in fact, just in the UK alone, there are over £7 billion of unspent loyalty points sitting on UK loyalty program balance sheets. So they decided the opportunity was to let users spend those unspent points to any charity that they chose. So from an emotionally engaging perspective, it's significantly more engaging. So that's just been launched in literally since April this year. So we're dying to see how that uh, works out for them. I think it's a great strategy. Moving on then, the other example I wanted to talk about is McDonald's. So again, everyone is probably already familiar with their um, McCafe strategy, which in fact in the UK and the US is the only loyalty uh, program that they operate. Again, by interest in China, McDonald's does have a loyalty program across its entire menu. Well, what I liked in addition to the transactional piece that we've already acknowledged, they did do a rebrand and they also decided they needed to be more emotionally engaging. And this was a three-day tactical campaign, which I thought really embodies uh, the humanity and the goodness that the brand is trying to associate with. So we have a 30-second video I'd love if we could just play to show this uh, Mac Cafe at Forward. We believe people are good. That's why from August 21st to 23rd, we're dropping 500 Mac Cafe at Forward cards across the U.S. If you get one, use it at McDonald's for one small free cup of premium roast coffee. Then pay it forward to a friend, someone who's done good in your life, or even a complete stranger. Just make sure to keep the good going. Let's show everyone there's a little good around every corner. We got this. Track the goodness at beabrewbitter.com. Make Cafe It Forward, August 21st to 23rd. Fantastic. Thank you for showing that. So just then the final point as we move on um, is really what we're calling extreme loyalty through subscriptions. And I guess what I really love about subscriptions is it's beyond just your customers giving you their data. It's beyond them giving you permission to market to them. It's actually when they start to give you permission to be a customer long term. So I think there's a really big shift and we're all familiar with subscriptions. I think um, in the traditional models, let's say, so with Netflix or with, um, for example, Amazon Prime. But to see it exploding the way we're currently seeing it in convenience retail is something that I don't think has had really maybe enough attention. Mm -hmm. So we've started writing and talking about it, Dan, as you know, with, with lots of the articles. And I have just a snapshot here. And again, we can talk about this maybe during the panel. Um, but there are five brands here. The first and the last, I suppose I'll highlight specifically, Panera Bread launched a coffee subscription program in the US, where you literally pay $9 a month for unlimited premium coffee. And the phenomenal results they reported, for example, 90% of people are retaining that subscription. There's an increase of 70% in spend on food with coffee subscribers. So there's a really interesting upsell and cross-sell with having a subscription program around something like coffee. I also wanted to talk about Circle K. We've seen them doing phenomenal work in car wash, which I really think is an exceptional opportunity and just wanted to give them a shout out to trying something very exciting, completely eliminating the uh, friction of washing your car as much as twice a day if you want to with one simple, again, auto billing every month. Again, Burger King, Coca-Cola and Tesco all doing phenomenal subscription programs. And uh, yeah, it's really interesting to see this being piloted all over the world. Yeah, it'd be great to get the panel's reaction to that in a minute, uh, Paula, but very interesting, I think. Great.
And the final one then actually is just one that um, I really hadn't realised, uh, the Dollar Shave Club. I'm sure many people have heard the brand, but um, I don't think shaving equipment was, was something anybody had really planned to subscribe to. Uh, but a number of years ago, the Dollar Shave Club really realised there was a perception problem with shaving equipment proving very expensive, running out at all the wrong times. So they decided to create a subscription model where they literally send now, in fact, all bathroom products out and it really disrupts disrupted our industry, I believe. And in fact, that brand was sold to Unilever for over a billion dollars um, a couple of years ago. So a real success story in the subscription space. So that's the, the final kind of example there. And just, I suppose, I wanted to mention on the last slide, we do a lot of talking about driving loyalty in convenience retail. I'm a big fan of podcasting and audio, as you know, Dan. So we'd love anybody who's interested in these case studies, anywhere you consume your podcasts on Spotify or, or Apple, you can listen to a case study every single week. Terrific. I really recommend listening in, uh, particularly, as you say, that one on KFC you've just done this week, which if you want to follow up on on, on what, what exactly KFC are doing in the Chinese market. It's, it's a heck of a story. Um, thank you very much, Paula. Um, please stay with us because we want to carry on a discussion. And um, if we could invite back uh, Ilias Munshi as well. Hi, Ilias. And um, also uh, introduce um, a very good friend of mine, uh, President and CEO of Rutter's, uh, Scott Hartman um, as well. Hi, Scott. Um, yeah. We've been uh, we've been chatting ahead of ahead of this, uh, and uh, lovely to see you on uh, on one of these uh, on one of these shop talks uh, again. Well, maybe I can, if it's okay with you guys, you've both done some talking. Let's Scott, uh, let's 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 get Scott to um, to say a few things as well. And what did you think, Scott, about the the, the you've seen the virtual tour of um, of the Frontier Park store and those those drive throughs I mean, drive throughs that's not a British thing, is it? I thought, I thought the Americans did drive throughs what, What's going on? <laughs> drive throughs in the U.S. definitely at QSRs have been there uh, for a long time, and that's been a high percentage of sales going through uh, a quick service restaurant. Um, as far as convenience stores, um, it's been kind of slow to catch on. We actually built our first drive throughs in 1995, and I think we had about 10 of them. Um, and we just, we just, at the time with technology, we could not uh, meet the service times because of the variety of offer. So we actually closed the drive-throughs. And now here we are back again in a day and age when drive-throughs are uh, for, you know, a significant part of the conversation for convenience stores. Um, the question really is, from, from my standpoint, is how, how do you meet the service level? And if you're able to isolate it off to a specific food offer, um, as uh, uh, EG has been able to do where it's a KFC offer only um, or a Starbucks offer only. Uh, that That's the QSR model and that works very well. When you extend that offer out to the entire store, it, it's much more difficult to execute on because you have things like uh, people having to run through a store quickly to get to the various products. And, and you know, stores are big today. Ours are particularly big, 10,000 square feet. No, absolutely. Now, of course, Ilias, um, I'm talking about you as if you're a British reseller. And of course, when I first started talking to you, that was true. It's no longer true, is it? Because um, yeah. <laughs> Dan, you followed our journey. So uh, from humble beginnings in uh, the UK uh, to where we are now as a, as a global business. And uh, yeah, uh, just uh, building on what Paul and Scott have kind of mentioned, um, the whole piece around having an engaging experience for the customer that's important and uh, i think scott's touched on this point around do customers who visit convenience stores are they looking uh, for, for drive-through um and um it does present its own challenges and i think in the us uh, what we've seen with our network um circa 70 percent of customers if we've got a drive-through on food service they'll use it um so there's a high take up but with the convenience store piece, um, the challenges, operational chal challenges in terms of processing the order, uh, when do you recognize the customers arrived? So how do they tell the staff inside the store? And then when, once they've taken the order outside, how do they identify which car or vehicle to drop the items off in? So curbside, I think, um, and uh, the, the whole kind of technology piece works a lot better with food service 
Uh, where it's a bit more of a challenge is the convenience store side, but a lot of retailers are exploring this space. And I think the debate is, do you go down the kind of scan and go model, where you enable the customers to come in and then just pick up their items, and but then the, 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 the bit that goes against that approach is the shrinkage. Uh, you get a lot of theft and people walking out with items. Uh, and the other extreme is curbside. Uh, there's no wrong or right solution at this moment in time. And uh, me and Scott had a thought we'd make a lot of money from this. But um, these are the challenges that retailers are facing. Uh, we need to do something on the convenience store side. But what does that look like and does it work with the consumer? Great. Well, but look, just just because I know um, every retailer likes to show off his beautiful stores, and uh, let's just show a few of the Rutter's stores, just because you haven't had your turn, Scott. And uh, you know, there's some we got some nice pictures, uh, which I think you'll you'll appreciate here. Um, so you've carried on the innovation through this, haven't you, Scott? You know, in terms of doing new stuff. Well, um, yeah, technology's been you know in our DNA for for a long time at, at Rudders, and uh, yes, it's been fun watching it go through the generational changes, um, you know. And we we really started um, doing things back in the 1990s uh, with things like a website that nobody else had. So, um, and now you see where you are today, where we we had mobile apps before anybody else did, and um, just the whole digital world um, is something that we've been having in our vision for a long time. So you can see we've got, we had digital gas price signs long before other people did. We have digital marketing on our uh, gas price sign out there. Uh, we have digital on our gas pumps. We have TVs in our stores around our food service. Uh, we, we had uh, kiosk ordering for our food service uh, long before many. Um, so uh, it's, it's just the way to create that experience for the customer and you just have to be willing to be bold enough to uh, to go out there and try these things and then uh, see how they respond. And uh, yeah, I'm just accustomed to answering a lot of those questions like, is anybody ever going to use a website or why would I, you know, how would a phone work to do anything? Um, but, you know, back in 2006, I, I presented at an act show and I told people they're going to be using their phones to pay. And the car is going to have an in-store billboard in it. And you look at that, the car today, and it identifies where you can find fuel. It identifies all the offers inside your car. So you just have to be willing to kind of look globally. And that's what you've always been so good at, Dan, is getting people in that global perspective. Because some of the things that I saw and brought back to my company came from uh, Asia. A lot of things came from Asia at the time. Um, but as you bring these mixes in of technology and the customer experience, and you've been great at showing people um, that every part of the world has a real great strength. And the key for all of us as retailers is to go figure out what their strength is and then learn from it. Well, can I just to, to, to do, Paula, to take some of the points you made and, and put it to them to Scott and then Ilias next, and perhaps starting with you, Scott. Um, what did you think about uh, the, the subscription idea and how that seems to be taking off i mean do you think that's i mean i guess subscription paula to your point was was growing and and big um outside of convenience retail for some time mm -hmm. and now we have the situation where i mean as someone summed it up in one of our shop talks recently uh for the consumer dirty is now equates to lethal um you know from the point of view of safety and so on so anything that's cuts down the friction is yeah. is good you know for the consumer so do you think i mean scott do you think uh that that, that subscription is as what how do you call it um extreme loyalty extreme loyalty <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the concept of subscription I, I i really do and i i think technology is just getting to the the place where we can actually deploy it across the different um points of sale um, so that's always been a challenge is the integration of something like a subscription model and it actually can work out at your car wash entry point while it could also work inside your store, while it could also potentially work at your gas pumps. I think those, those have always been a historic challenge we've had as an industry because of the disparate nature of our points purchase systems. But now the ability to use apps and, and as Italy said, to be able to overlay an app that can replace the individual points of sale uh, that 
that you know a KFC may have or a Starbucks may have or a car wash entry system may have, to be able to overlay that in a technology platform, I think is definitely a great opportunity for, for everybody moving yeah. forward. I think just, yeah, just to add on that, um, I think what Paul touched on about um, KFC in China, um, if you look at one of the, the most popular apps in Ch the Chinese market, it's an app called Chat, mm. and um, something which was uh, created as a social media platform. Yeah. Uh, you, you can pay for uh, food, anything. Uh, a lot of retail partners are part of that environment. Mm. So in, in markets like China, customers, kind of transition to this kind of um, uh, environment where it's one app which has multi uh, uses yeah. uh, and that kind of omni-channel approach regardless of what the brand offer is is in that one kind of uh, technology platform i think that's what consumers globally are kind of uh, uh, crying out for is totally. the markets we operate in it might be that's, all. that's a massive yeah. challenge uh, yeah. given all the kind of different uh, silos of technology yeah. that partners operate. I think the subscription piece is very interesting. Mm -hmm. I think um, for years, uh, brands like Starbucks have tried to get people to preload uh, money or cash onto the app. Um, so again, subscription is another way of giving confidence to the consumer in what you are offering. So as long as it's uh, consistent, the quality is there, so brands like Panera and uh, some of the other brands that are on that slide, they can offer that extreme loyalty because they have a, a reputation uh, backing the offer. So again, I think for a lot of retailers is to kind of think, do we want to position ourselves that way? Mm. Offer a subscription service. Yes, mm. customers will sign up, mm. but they are signing up to something where they're expecting certain standards and expectations. And maybe in this new environment, that is the new norm. Yeah. Might, might well be so. Just let's bring in a few questions, and, 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 and uh, I think it will help us make it get to some of our next points. So Richard Smith from the UK has said, how much further do you think convenience stores and retail hubs can grow in footprint in terms of size, I think, and diverse offerings in the next five years? So what else can you get in there which will help drive it as a destination? And maybe we can pull up the Rutter's picks, which show what you've done with... Um, with wine and spirits, um, because this is this is something that's really worked very well for you, hasn't it, Scott? It has, and you know, the, the old saying, timing is everything. Um, we just happened to, a few years ago, have the, some of the laws changed to allow the majority of our stores to get into the, the wine and spirits businesses. Um, and uh, we got into it, and uh, during this, uh, crisis, people are definitely turning toward um, alcohol consumption as a coping mechanism. And so uh, that's, that's just a natural human thing. They, they turn to different things. And so our stores now have large wine, uh, beer, and this is, a, this is a store you see on the left here that was uh, just opened about a week ago in West Virginia, where we're allowed to sell spirits. And so that's the benefit of having a big store. And so one of the things, you know, looking at the EG store that, that you showed earlier, again, I think real estate provides opportunity. And one of the things that I've talked to the industry about forever is that um, most retailers, if you ask them, what is the one mistake you've made through the years that you wish you could have changed? And that is, I didn't build a store big enough. Wow. <laughs> we're all trying to get more stuff into a store, right? We didn't, we didn't buy enough real estate. We had to go back and buy another parcel, and that was very expensive had we bought it originally. So, so the large pieces of real estate pay off, and I'm not sure how big big is. I mean, we, when we built our, our yeah. big stores, our super stores back in the 1990s, they were about 4,000 square feet, and they were some of the biggest in the industry. Then we went to six. Then we went to eight. Now we're over 10. And I still find myself saying, geez, I just put that spirits area in a 10,000 square foot store, and now I wish I had more, more space. Well, Frontier Park is, is huge, isn't it, uh, Ilias, to that point? Yeah, no, and, uh, I think there's uh, uh, some key elements that you've got to introduce in your locations. One is um, you've got to have the space to be able to do things with it, like Scott is kind of alluding to. Um, but I think if, if you look at the next five years, where do we stop? Um, you know, already convenience stores 
are, are offering, um, uh, like in the UK, for example, we have ATM machines where people can uh, take cash. Do we then start offering uh, a, a few more banking services where people can deposit cash, etc.? Does it become a, a destination? And I think that that piece around destination, we have pharmacies. So again, in the US, it's quite common to see uh, a pharmacy, a CVS, or any uh, pharmaceutical kind of retail uh, on, a, on, a, on a roadside location. Um, so y- we've seen pharmacies evolve. Uh, we've seen kind of postal services kind of show up on uh, gas stations and convenience stores. The whole, whole kind of uh, gambit in terms of high street, whatever was on the high street, as now kind of people are thinking creatively and saying, uh, can it be accessible from these retail destinations? I think that's the important bit. bit. But comes with uh, offering that kind of space, parking, security, um, accessibility, uh, making sure it's all kind of clearly laid out as well. So when the customers come, it's not a kind of a maze and a mishmash of everything. Um, it, it allows... Uh, what we're going to see the, in five to ten years time retail within retail um, so you'll see multiple brands operating within the convenience store space so there'll be small spaces allocated to uh, different categories of items uh, so in the UK for example at Frontier Park um, vaping uh, is quite popular for the customer uh, we've actually put a, a, a kind of a module in there where the biggest kind of ticket item for the customer is the actual vaping units. People need advice and guidance around what's good, what works for them, uh, the frequency of usage. So we have it manned all the time in terms of the customer getting advice and buying those items. Also, uh, having somebody there, they can advise on new flavors, the liquids that are coming out. Uh, you know, so, so it's adding that additional layer of retail within that same space, but it's changing that customer experience. Very good. Now, Paula, just a question that's coming for you. Uh, Do you actually think consumers want more choice with apps, an app for fuel, an app for car wash, an app for the sea store, or do they want one app? And obviously, this this is a question that Ilias also spoke to. I think it's a really good question. Um, And I think people are genuinely craving... Jonathan Davis asked that question. Sorry, I should always mention No problem. That's fine. You can hear me okay. I do think people are looking for um, simplicity, first and foremost. And I think they're being more selective about the brands they want to connect with, which is why I think it's really important to have them front and center. And Ilias, you mentioned from an EG group perspective, you know, focusing on the customer. And I think that's a mistake in the past. A lot of us have focused on our products and all of that. But really, if you think, what does the customer want? That single layer of technology, I think, is fantastic. Fantastic. I also think historically uh, people mightn't have wanted a convenience store app, for example. It's probably why it was one of the latest sectors to move into the loyalty space, but certainly the pandemic has proved that it is now essential. And I think more of us are going, okay, actually that is my neighborhood store, that is part of my community, and definitely that is one I will engage with. So I think it's important to do it well, and I think it's important to keep it super simple. And just to finish, I think the point about uh, subscriptions, I really believe that's the key insight is I know I want to buy coffee every single day and I know I want to get my car washed. So I'll just make that decision once a month. And as long as it's working for me, that's the decision made. So I think it works really well. Very, very good. And Scott, I mean, you, you've had terrific benefit, haven't you, from, uh, from your early move into apps as far as, uh, as, far as um, Russ's are concerned? Uh, we have. I mean, it was, uh, it was a great technology throughout the last more than a decade now with our mobile app because um, the customers that are loyal to you really use this stuff Mm. and you get to understand those customers so much better. Uh, What are they buying? Uh, When are they in your store? Uh, What are they, what do they like? And your opportunity to engage with them through mobile apps and things of the like. I mean, we had games very early on um, in our app. Uh, we have sweepstakes that we run. So based upon your purchases, you can um, you can win prizes. Based upon your purchases, we have a uh, vote with your dollars. So you can donate um, uh, money to charity or money to charity, but with your votes. Um, so it's, a, it's about engagement. It's about making it fun um, and trying to keep changing with them. So we, we just came out with our new app uh, a 
few months ago, um, and it's it's our 2.0, and it's developing into uh, into some other things that I can't really tell you what we're going to put into it, but we're we're definitely redeveloping it as a uh, another way to keep engaging that customer. Terrific. Well, we you know we could carry on, um, and if we were in the same country, we probably would, wouldn't we? And uh, and continue this discussion. Um, but um, we, we time time's up. We've overrun slightly, but I, it was just too interesting to to bring to an early halt. So, Paula, thank you very much. Uh, Ilias, really appreciate. Oh, thank you, Dan. Thank you again for, for your time, and um, you know, really appreciate you sharing. And I, I know the audience do as well. Um, and uh, it, it helps the whole industry to to keep sharing these good ideas that you you you, you all keep having. So, thank you very much for for joining us on Shop Talk Live, and see see you again soon. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Great being with everybody. Well, again, thank you to, to our panel, um, uh, Ilias, Paula, Scott. Um, uh, appreciate you, you spending time with us. Um, well, we, we're slightly overrun, but I thought we were having some interesting discussions, so we, we, we slightly uh, extended today. Um, again, uh, just, to, just to round up, thank you very much for watching. Um, just leaving you with a and finally story. Um, which is that I just noticed on LinkedIn that Brewdog, a uh, famous sort of um, famous uh, 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 brewer, um, have started introducing their own drive-throughs. This isn't a, this is a reality in across. I think they're going to open these in Australia, Germany, US, and the UK. And it's um, it's a it's a drive-through, a Brewdog drive-through, and this is a sketch of it. But I, you know, as far as I understand it, these are going to be opening. Um, probably not that many of them, but certainly a few. There be a collection points. Okay, and um, there are also hubs for electric vehicle deliveries um, for uh, and also uh, for zero waste packaging. Um, so uh, interesting to see where this goes. I mean, their, their strap line is um, delivering cold craft beer to our customers in a way that's better for the planet. So, you know, keep an eye on drive throughs, I think, uh, is, is one of the big, uh, big learnings from this Shop Talk Live. And thanks for watching. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to visit that brew dog drive through very soon. Thanks very much. Good afternoon.